So um, welcome everyone. Um, it is really great to see uh, so many in attendance and also to see so many familiar and nice people <laughs> in the audience here tonight. So my name is Liv Ingeborg Lied and I am the director of the research center MF Kasser, which is MF, the Center for Advanced Study of Religion at MF Norwegian School of Theology of Religion and Society in Oslo. So the MF Kasser annual lecture is one of the absolute highlights of the year at the center. And this is the third year that this is taking place. And it is a particularly great pleasure and an honor for me to introduce this year's lecturer, uh, Professor Annette Yoshiko Reed. Uh, as many of you will already know, Reed is a religious historian and a professor in the Skirbel Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies and Department of Religious Studies at New York University. Her research profile includes studies of Second Temple Jewish texts, Jewish Christian relations, parabiblical writings, and Jewish knowledge traditions in antiquity, among other things. Reed is famous for, for her innovative approaches her hunch for new and exciting perspectives on old challenges, her thorough treatment of both the source materials and previous research contributions, her spot on analysis and her undeniable wit and academic hunch. As you can tell, I'm a fan <laughs> and I have been a fan for a long time. The title of professor's, uh, Professor Reed's paper today is Archival Amnesia, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Biblical Canon and Forgotten Jewish and the Forgotten Jewish Past. And I'm quoting here from her abstract. Archives and anthologies are commonly viewed as technologies of preservation, protecting the memory of the past from the dangers of forgetting, and perhaps nowhere more so than with scriptures. Drawing upon theoretical and historiographical insights of the archive, this lecture looks instead to what is forgotten and relegated to forgetting in the process of archivalization. To do so, it looks especially to what the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls has revealed about the power of biblical canons in shaping and constraining the memory of the biblical past. What, what might we see instead when we focus on their amnesia-inducing effects? as engines and fulcrums of forgetting? And what might we recover in the process about the cultural power of forgetting? So in the next one and a half hour, Reed will first give her paper. And then my dear colleague, Dr. Blossom Stefaniu, who's an Heisenberg professor for intellectual history of Christianity at MF will respond to Reed's lecture. And finally, we open up for Q and A and discussion. Uh, uh, Dr. Esther Brownsmith is with me uh, to manage the Q&A function. Esther, do you want to say something about how we want this to work? Uh, sure, just that if you have questions, you can put them at any point into the Q&A button. And that way we will know to get to them at the end of the lecture. And if you put them in chat, sometimes things get lost and moved around. So please do just put any questions you have into the Q&A and we will get to them in turn. Thank you. Great. So I guess we are more or less ready to get started. Please, Annette, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much. So um, first of all, I want to thank Liv and Esther and the entire, and Blossom and the entire um, Books Known Only by Title team, um, both um, for the invitation to be here um, and also um, just for what's been a very um, interesting series of talks in which I'm glad to, to also be be in. I mean, the um, I was noting that it's. Um, I do regret not being there in Oslo, but it has been among the 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 benefits of seeing various kind of Zoom events. I think the whole series of books known only to title events and related materials have really kind of exemplified the way in which that's really opened up a broader conversation and community. And it's something I've really benefited from as I've been working on kind of parallel or interesting parallel or intersecting themes. So thank you all for that. Um, and I'm delighted to be here, even if I would, part of me would prefer to actually be there. <laughs> you know, maybe some other day. Um, so with that, let me share my screen. All right. No great value should be attached to them and they will shed no light on the life of Jews of the pre-Christian period. 
thus wrote Solomon Zeitlin in 1953, cautioning against any excitement at the so-called discovery of Hebrew scrolls by Bedouin shepherds. Zeitlin was reacting specifically to news of a set of scrolls discovered in 1947, one of which contained the full text of the biblical book of Isaiah. At the time, the oldest known Hebrew biblical manuscript was the Nash Papyrus, but this fragment contained only a small handful of verses and thus could not serve as a textual witness to the Bible in any full sense. For this, scholars were still dependent at the time on medieval manuscripts dated from the ninth century and following. What was claimed for this newly discovered scroll, however, was a full Hebrew text of the book of Isaiah from 2000 years prior. These were among the first of what we now call the Dead Sea Scrolls already in 1948, hearing about only this first handful of what would later become over 900 fragments from the scrolls from the caves near Kirbet Qumran. The biblical archeology span proclaimed this as the most important discovery ever made in Old Testament manuscripts. In a series of articles in the Jewish Quarterly Review, however, Solomon Zeitlin voiced his doubts. In his view, the authenticity and date of this Isaiah scroll had to be judged in relation to the scrolls discovered with it. But these included a commentary on Habakkuk. And for Zeitlin, this seemed simply impossible. It is axiomatic, Zeitlin explained. Jews did not write commentaries on prophetic books in the pre-Christian period since the very need for such commentaries did not actually arise until a much later period. At the time, it was commonplace among scholars to hold that the canonization of the Jewish Bible occurred in three clear cut and successive stages, which corresponded exactly to the three sections in which biblical books are now arranged in the Jewish Bible or Tanakh, that is Torah, Nevi'im and prophets, or Torah, Nevi'im or prophets and Ketuvim or writings. And this contention of successive stages in canonization was applied to interpretation as well, with rabbinic midrash, for instance, purporting to have preceded Jewish practices of writing commentaries. This is part of why the antiquity of Pesher Habakkuk struck Zeitlin as impossible. This was far too early for Jews to be writing commentaries on prophetic books, and they certainly should not have been doing so on prophetic books like Habakkuk. Thus, Zeitlin reasoned, this newly discovered commentary could only be medieval and so too with all the scrolls with it. About this, he was absolutely certain. Undoubtedly, he declared, these are works of the Middle Ages. Speculating about the true origins of all the scrolls instead, not in caves, but rather perhaps in synagogues or genizot that had been looted for profit. In the years that followed, more and more scrolls were discovered and deciphered, eventually including fragments corresponding to almost all of the books now in the Hebrew Bible, as well as countless other Jewish writings, primarily in Hebrew and Aramaic. But throughout it all, Zeitlin held firm to his position. In his view, their antiquity was simply an impossibility from what was then known of the history of Jewish literature. And if scholars like W.F. Albright thought otherwise, it only betrayed their lack of knowledge of Judaism. A scholar must stay in his own field, Zeitlin proclaimed, and he fretted again, unless, in his words, this type of sensationalist news might deceive students not well versed in the rabbinic literature of the Middle Ages, and they might be led to think that these discoveries have great value for the history of Judaism and Christianity. Zeitlin was proven wrong. Paleographical analysis, as well as carbon dating, soon confirmed that the first scrolls found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as the hundreds thereafter, date from between the third century BCE and the first century CE, that is long before the Middle Ages, even prior to the rise of rabbinic Judaism, and instead part of what scholars commonly call the second temple period of Jewish history. In retrospect, it also turned out to be quite an understatement to say these discoveries have a great value. In fact, they have been transformative for the history of Judaism and Christianity alike. If there's a lesson to learn from Zeitlin's error, however, it is perhaps not about the dangers of skepticism, 
Countless other cases, from the James Ossuary to the so-called gospel of Jesus's wife, have borne out Zeitlin's warning not to resort to wild speculations or make sensationalist statements to the press before the documents have been produced for careful study. Furthermore, he was actually quite right. These particular scrolls are best studied by scholars with an expertise in Judaism no less than Christianity and must be examined by a student of rabbinic literature, in his words, in addition to specialists in the Hebrew Bible and New Testament. Even now, but especially then, his reasoning makes perfect sense. What makes his case instructive, thus, in my view, is not that he was wrong, but why. On one level, Zeitlin's heir was surely linked to his own confidence. After all, he was celebrated in his own time as the world's leading authority on Second Temple Judaism, and as a man with a prodigious memory for all pre-modern Jewish literature. More interestingly for our purpose is how his confidence in his own memory dovetailed with his confidence in the Jewish tradition as memory. That is, as purportedly having preserved the pre-modern Jewish past with enough totality that everything must fit within its frameworks. Historians could certainly fill in gaps as he often claimed to do, but Zeitlin presumed that any new evidence could only be supplement or complement, detail or footnote to a narrative that was already set and known and full and certain. That was his problem with texts like Pesher Habakkuk. They contravened his sense of what was early, what was late, what patterns in Jewish history were axiomatic. It may be tempting, of course, to dismiss Zeitlin as an example of past scholarship superseded by the progress of new research. In my view, however, there's a, something more to be learned from attending to the gap between what he thought he knew and what the Dead Sea Scrolls have demonstrated. What the Dead Sea Scrolls revealed about the Jewish past looked impossible from what Zeitlin already knew. But as such, his reaction thus stands as a poignant embodiment, pointing to how, just how much of the literary heritage of Second Temple Judaism had become lost to later Jewish tradents so forgotten that even its forgetting had been forgotten by their modern heirs. Zeitlin writes of the Jewish tradition as if nothing significant could have ever fallen out. But this is not due to any lack of knowledge. In fact, it's precisely because of it. In this sense, his reaction to the Dead Sea Scrolls points us also to the dynamic of tradition as archive, as an embodiment of memory that functions at no less as an engine of forgetting. This is among the dynamics that I'm exploring in my current book project, which takes up the topic of forgetting precisely through the test case of the Second Temple past and its Jewish reception. There I looked at what was lost with the Dead Sea Scrolls, but I also use this loss as a lens through which to reconsider Jewish memory. The Dead Sea Scrolls gives us glimpses into what vistas were closed off with the narrowing of the archive for Jewish antiquity in the centuries after 70 CE. To look back at this past from these vistas, moreover, is thus also an opportunity to ask how it came to be that so little trace was even left. How did it come to be that a scholar of Zeitlin's expertise could notice no smudge of an erasure nor even hear an echo of a silenced voice? How did certain narratives about ancient Judaism come to seem by his time into a scholar like him as if they were the only stories that even could be told? Among my aims in that book is to use this particular test case to map out a broader taxonomy of cultural forgetting as not just limited to a passive realm of loss or incidental lapse, nor to active authoritarian suppression, but rather as encompassing a variegated range of microdynamics in between, including, for instance, liturgical, ritual, and pedagogical acts of pruning and partitioning time into usable pasts, literary acts of overwriting and rewriting texts, figures, and events, historiographical acts of collapsing, compressing, and periodizing parts of the past into chronological narratives, and archival acts that collect and collectivize selective pieces of the past as if a whole. In my time with you here today, I'd like to reflect on these archival acts in particular. To do so, I'll first look to some theoretical and historiographical insights into the archive. Then I will turn to Bible and canon in particular, asking what these examples might tell us about archivalization and its amnesia-inducing effects. 
And lastly, I want to reflect on the creative power of archival amnesia by using one example that the Dead Sea Scrolls permits us to recover before and beyond the Bible with respect to Jewish engagement in what is known from Greek and other non-Jewish sources as an archival impulse that rippled across the Hellenistic Near East in the third and second centuries BCE, from Callimachus in Alexandria to Berossus in Babylon. In the process, I'd like to make a case for attending to forgetting even, or perhaps especially, within those fields such as Jewish studies that have tended to privilege continuity. What's at stake, I shall suggest, is not just a richer understanding of the cultural dynamics of memory, but perhaps also the possibility of a more capacious historiography, which takes seriously the limits of each our own purviews onto the past as partial and fragmentary, situated and positioned, and thus potentially also multivocal and multifocal as well. But first, what do we mean by archival? On the one hand, theorists such as Jacques Derrida have spoken of the archive in relation to knowledge making, textuality, desire, and its limits. On the other hand, librarians, bibliographers, and historians have used this very same rubric to denote a variety of specific sites and institutions dedicated to textual storage. Paradigmatically, those places that house civic, state, imperial, legal, or other official documents. In some modern settings, this sense of the archive can be distinguished from the library as a term designating sites that house literary works also or instead. To be sure, however, for our purposes, the distinction is now not always quite so clear, especially because it's not always quite so clear within pre-modern cultures. But even so, the two rubrics, and especially the rubric of the archive, has proven useful for pushing precisely those questions that scholars of pre-modern literature sometimes forget to ask. What are the mechanics by which specific written materials were preserved in specific times and places? What was chosen to be preserved and why? What was omitted, whether explicitly, deliberately, or tacitly? what was stored for possible or even public access, and what was preserved in a manner that was inaccessible in practice to all or most people, where and how and who decided. Even when our evidence does permit us to answer with certainty for pre-modern cultures, attention to the archives has thus formed part of a push to take seriously the materiality of literary and documentary texts alike not just as containers for ideas, but also objects in their own right. We are reminded thus that texts are objects, they take up space and need storage. And even when stored, they can stand in varying degrees of danger, such as from insects, rodents, bathing, water, fire, or neglect, not even to mention the deliberate culling that is also no less integral to all archival practice when overaccumulation meets the limits of a physical space. For the study of pre-modern Jews and Judaism, the interdisciplinary discourse about the archive has already proved quite useful. Laura Carlson Hassler, for instance, has shown how attention to archives can enrich our understanding of the formation of biblical texts like Ezra and Nehemiah. And as Marina Rustow has demonstrated for the Cairo Geniza, the study of lost and found materials can benefit even more. Part of the power of accidental discovery, as she shows, is to expose the partiality of what we thought we knew about the past and to open up a space for the reassessment of all of our sources. This is part of my concern as well. In addition, however, I'm also concerned with what we might miss, including about our own practice when we treat archives as if self-evidently a technology of memory that we as historians use and engage and expand. And thus, for my purposes, the theorization of the archive also proves no less useful in pointing to the cultural power of forgetting. Forgetting is a topic that has remained largely under theorized even in the interdisciplinary subfield of memory studies, as Paul Connerton, Bradford Vivian, and others have recently stressed. Vivian, in particular, notes how much of the diverse scholarship grounded under the heading of modern memory studies reflects preoccupations with archiving, documenting, otherwise preserving traces of an ostensibly organic past threatened by the alleged fragmentation of the present. 
This is what Vivian terms a preservationalist ethic that in his view has resulted in the moralization of memory and forgetting even among scholars. Ours, he notes, is a culture that typically treats memory as a rich and vibrant means of preserving the past, while forgetting it as a form of commemorative passivity or neglect, a symptom of the undesirable dissolution of communal heritage or historical wisdom. And hence, he notes, even in memory studies and also beyond, acts of forgetting are commonly framed as ethical failings, whereas imperatives to archive, document, and preserve are seen to hold a moral high ground. What Vivian observes of memory studies in particular resonates all the more so with the treatment of memory within Jewish studies. This is explicit in fact already in what remains the most influential book on the topic, that is Yosef Yerushalmi's Zahor. Zahor famously links remembrance to Jewish peoplehood while dismissing forgetting simply as failure in quite a straightforward sense. But even as Yerushalmi famously dwells upon the difference between pre-modern Jewish memory and modern Jewish history, he is able thus to pit both firmly against forgetting. It's as a result that Yerushalmi, for instance, can cast himself as historian, as a custodian of the Jewish past. Against the agents of oblivion, he opines, only the historian with the austere passion for fact, proof, and evidence can effectively stand guard. In a moment, we'll return to what Yerushalmi himself forgets about the very past he purports to guard. For now, it suffices to note how the theoretical discussion of the archive unsettles the seemingly self-evident approach to memory, forgetting, the historian, and the tradition. To Yerushalmi, for instance, we might contrast the approach of historians such as Sadia Hartman, who have theorized from within their experience with working with archival materials to try to reconstruct the stories of those traditionally omitted from historical narratives, such as in Hartman's case, enslaved people and women. To attempt to write about slavery, for instance, from the perspective of the enslaved is, as Hartman notes, always to struggle with and against the constraints and silences imposed by the nature of the archive, which he describes as the system that governs the appearance of statements and generates social meaning. And thus, she points to a broader phenomenon. The archive dictates what can be said about the past and the kinds of stories that can be told. The amnesia induced by the archive, in other words, does not just pertain to what information is and is not contained therein. It also pertains to the narrowing of who is remembered and the naturalization of this very narrowing, which is rendered as if invisible or inevitable, together with who decides, who categorizes, who chooses, who cultivates, and who calls, and for whom access is even designed and enabled. When reflecting on the modern institution of the state archive, Ashil Mumembe further notes both the partiality of all archives and how this partiality becomes effaced. In his words, no archive can be the depository of an entire history of a society. Through archive documents, we are presented rather with pieces of time to be assembled, fragments of life to be placed in order, in attempt to formulate a story that acquires its coherence through the ability to craft links from beginning to end. A montage of fragments thus creates an illusion of totality and continuity. This illusion of totality and continuity is produced in part, he continues, because the archive is not just a place, but it's also a status, the product of a process which converts a certain number of documents into items judged worthy to be preserving and keeping in a public place where they can be consulted according to well-established procedures. The process relegates what is excluded to forgetfulness in as much as it entails the granting of a privileged status to certain documents and the refusal of that status to others. But he goes further in proposing that this, that this is a process of despoilment, even for the documents therein preserved. Archivalization, in his view, is rooted in death inasmuch as the archival document par excellence, in his words, is generally a document whose author is dead. Its relationship to the living has been reconfigured both by closure and by the resulting distance from the immediate present. 
Such insights point thus to what is missed when we approach the archive as if simply a technology of memory pitted against forgetting. Archivalization, after all, can come with its own forgetting, we are reminded, and this forgetting is doubled. What is omitted is relegated to oblivion, while what is included becomes departicularized, at once totalized yet homogenized, omnisignificant yet distant. It's in this sense, I suggest that theoretical and historiographical insights into the archive might help us to articulate some of what we have learned or have yet to learn about the Bible from the evidence of the Dead Sea Scrolls. When we presume continuity and study memory making by only attending to evidence of preservation, the Bible might seem to be the embodiment of memory emblematizing what's commonly assumed today about writing in general and scripture in particular as the ultimate technologies for preserving the heritage of the past. And this is especially true with what's come to be reified as biblical after the advent of printing as the Bible has come to be imagined now as a book closed and set and fixed and finite as if a single and stable textual object. We see quite a different picture, however, when we look back to the same past, instead through the lens of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which include manuscript evidence for the continued textual fluidity of now biblical books during Second Temple times, as well as evincing the comparable antiquity and popularity of some of what came to be received in modern times under alternate labels like Old Testament Apocrypha and Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. Together with previously unknown related works that engage and expand upon such memory making around key moments of Israel's past, these data thus contravene the presumption of any clear line between biblical and post-biblical already in Second Temple times. Scholarship on the formation of the biblical canon has tended to focus on the question of when it was closed thus casting the second temple period as if simply one step or stage along the way to our Bible. In this, in practice, the telos has been what we see among Christians in late antiquity, who in the fourth and fifth centuries CE do indeed engage in a discourse of canonization as closure. Christians like Athanasius, for instance, do indeed grant a certain text a status as canonical through the explicit denial of that same status to others through the making of lists. What's not so clear, however, is, that, is whether we find such a concern with closure already in Second Temple times. On the one hand, we have the evidence of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but on the other hand, even those other Second Temple texts commonly cited as precedents for closure and canonical process are, are really marked instead by a rhetoric of totality that is open in a sense of capacious inclusion, including everything, not closing to include only some. In fact, even after 70 CE and even among rabbinic Jews, it's really not quite clear when we find a sense of canon as closure that's akin to what we see among late antique Christians. Notwithstanding the handful of early rabbinic dicta about outside books, we don't find Jewish canonical lists, for instance, until the Talmud. The archival dynamic that we do see is similar but different, and it's one of distancing. Even if it's unclear precisely when the Tanakh became bounded as if a closed book, its pieces did in fact come to be increasingly received as if exhausting everything that needs to be known about the pre-Rabbinic Jewish past. And in part, with Mumembe, we might note that this functions in part as a partitioning of that biblical past from what's thereby cast as a Rabbinic present. This sense of the rabbinic approach to the Bible as exhausting all that needs to be known about the ancient Jewish past is among the key insights of Yerushalmi Zahor. What's no less interesting for our purposes is the degree to which it also applies to Yerushalmi and to much of Jewish studies as well. Not only does Yerushalmi trace the centrality of memory for Jewish peoplehood back to biblical times, but he positions the Bible as the first and main object of Jewish remembrance, thereby aligning the textuality of Torah into the remembrance of tradition writ large. 
For him, moreover, canonization is key. And Yerushalmi even goes so far to draw a straight line from Nehemiah's account of Ezra's public reading of the Torah after the return from the Babylonian exile to what he posits as the closing of the biblical canon at a so-called Council of Yavna soon after the Roman destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE. Most telling, however, for our purpose is what he forgets in his rush to draw this straight line from Ezra to the rabbis. In what still stands as the most influential scholarly book about Jewish memory, that is Zahor, the entire Second Temple period is all but forgotten. It has become reduced, in fact, to the tale of the canonization of the Hebrew Bible. Or in other words, the Bible as archive has dictated what can be said about the past and the kinds of stories that can be told even about the Second Temple period. Nor is it perhaps coincidental that Yerushalmi's account echoes the narrative of canonization held in the time of Zeitlin and by Zeitlin himself. Yerushalmi's Zahor was published in the 1980s, three decades after the quotes from Zeitlin with which we began. Yerushalmi, however, makes no mention of the Dead Sea Scrolls. All that he notes of Second Temple literature are one and two Maccabees and the writings of Josephus, which are here cited as exemplary of the history that is said to have been abandoned by post-70 um, Jews due to the rabbinic preference for the memory of Torah and tradition. Yerushalmi never asks what else might have been remembered or forgotten, let alone written of memory and forgetting in the six centuries separating Ezra and the Mishnah. To be sure, scholars of Second Temple Judaism no longer hold to this old view of the closing of the Jewish biblical canon at the so-called Council of Yavna, and few would write about the Second Temple period without mentioning the Dead Sea Scrolls. Much like Yerushalmi, however, many still do work within a framework of ancient Judaism that remains largely unchanged by the evidence of the Dead Sea Scrolls. No one follows Zeitlin in treating these scrolls as hoax or fiction, but many still do bracket this evidence as if it's simply supplementary to the same old narrative of ancient Jewish history that was common in even a century before their discovery. The theory of three-stage canonization, for instance, goes back to Henry Gritz. And to this day, the story of Second Temple Judaism is commonly told as still a story about the rise of scripture and its interpretation as a purportedly post-biblical era marked by the supposed closing of the biblical canon. Part of what's powerful about the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, in my view, is the shock of an accidental glimpse into a pre-canonical moment in Judaism that due to these data can no longer be treated as if simply proto-canonical. When scholars had far less evidence, it might've made sense to try to connect the dots between the exile and the rabbis with one straight line, imagining the second temple period as simply a successive developmental stage to the closing of the biblical canon of what we now think of as the Bible, as if seed or sprout to what could only be a tree. With far more evidence, however, we can now say far more about Second Temple Judaism on its own terms, but we can also glimpse how our own views of the ancient Jewish past have been skewed by the archival amnesia of canonization. With the Memembe, for instance, we might notice how canonization affords a status that preserves, but also distances and despoils, not least by departicularizing all that comes within. To speak of biblical text, for instance, is to homogenize what's actually a highly variegated set of Hebrew writings. And it's also to presume that the reception, for instance, of prophetic books and their authority would have necessarily hewn to the same lines as the reception of the Torah, the reception of the Psalms, or the reception of sapiential literature, as if the difference were merely a matter of degree. And to lump these all into biblical, moreover, is to further departicularize in the sense of, of imposing a periodization that partitions the biblical past off from the historical time of the present while alighting the specificities of both. Why else, for instance, would we even assume that Jews would have always written about the flood or Israel's kings and prophets for the same reason that they wrote about creation or the patriarchs, but always and always supposedly different um, and for different reasons and purposes than they would choose to write about the Maccabees or the Romans or today. This is precisely what the biblical of both the Bible and biblical interpretation customarily aligned. 
evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls tells us much more about Second Temple Judaism, but also much more about the reception of what came, later came to be partitioned off from this period and configured and conflated instead into a biblical past. Part of what we can see in the process as John Reeves, Hindi Nyman, Ava Mrochek, and others have so richly shown us is the radical open-endedness of Jewish scripturality in Second Temple times. To this, I would like to add the power of this data to help us re-particularize. We see the reception of prophetic books like Habakkuk, for instance. It's consisting of more than simply their elevation to a status akin to Torah. We see evidence of concerns for different periods of Israel's past at different times and for quite different purposes, as Devorah de Mont, for instance, has shown. We have data now with which to consider the Second Temple period is not just uniformly post-biblical, but is differing under Persian, Ptolemaic, Seleucid, Hasmonean, and early Roman rule, including in relation to which parts of Israel's past became a focus of memory and when and why and by whom. It was to this last point that Michael Stone pointed already in the 1970s, soon after the publication of the Aramaic fragments related to one Enoch which were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls and which showed that portions thereof likely date to the third century BCE. Stone stressed the power of this new evidence to reverse the puzzling forgetting surrounding the, second, the third century BCE and received a Jewish literature. To his insight, I might, we might also add the power of this evidence for, uh, to uh, illumine other and earlier sorts of archival amnesia. The era of Ptolemaic rule over the land of Israel, as Stone notes, is largely underrepresented in Jewish sources known prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. These finds, however, have provided new clues to Jewish literary production in the third and second centuries BCE, especially in Aramaic. I've written elsewhere about the ramifications for recovering forgotten elements of Judaism in the early Hellenistic age, particularly with respect to astronomy, angelology, and demonology. What's more pertinent for present purposes is that the same era was marked by an archival impulse across the Hellenistic world. These are the terms, for instance, that Tim Whitmarsh used to describe the imperial culture politics of the early Ptolemies, as most famous from the Library of Alexandria. As is well known, Jewish awareness of these efforts are clear from our very earliest evidence for this library anywhere, which comes from the letter of Aristeus and which voices a very sharp concern with what might be omitted precisely in the totalizing imperial claim to collect all the books of the world, that is, the omission of anything not in Greek. And even if we can't know much about this library at the time and how much was real and how much was imagined, it's very clear that the imagination captures something of a broader shift that we see across the Hellenistic world and had an impact of its own. Steve Johnstone, for instance, collects inscriptional as well as literary evidence that speaks to the rise of the prestige of books, writing, and library across the Mediterranean world, especially in the third and second centuries BCE what he terms the political objectification of the book. What Whitmarsh and Johnstone thus trace as an archival impulse within Greek materials, Johannes Halbold has further explored recently in relation to the repurposing and reimagining of older texts and traditions in the Hellenistic Near East, looking instead to the power of archive as contact zone as well. In this, he points especially to Berosus, who writing in the third century BCE in Greek, is a Babylonian priest who drew upon ancient Mesopotamian literature to present himself to Seleucid rulers as a barbarian philosopher priest, but also, Halbold argues, as the keeper of the archive of all human civilization. Not only does Barosis claim that the culture hero Oannes taught humankind all knowledge before the flood, but his account of the flood strikingly focuses, in Halbold's words, not on the survival of human life, but on the fate of what he calls writings. And thus he transforms the age old drama um, of human destruction by the flood into a drama about textual transmission. By Halbold's reading, what Barosis claims for Babylon is a total archive of textual knowledge, which is both universal and remains tethered to Babylon. His Hellenistic 
era retelling of the flood narrative, thus functions as an etiology of his own role as a keeper of the archive. And among the results is to defend the, the necessity of Babylonian scribes, even in a new Hellenistic age marked by the rising prestige of Greek paideia. It's not Alexandria that is global here, but rather Babylon. And thus it's also significant that Barossus's own writings is itself an archival act of sorts in the sense that it's anthological or as Halbold puts it, he assembles known elements from Mesopotamian tradition in a new and striking manner. Those familiar with the Enoch literature will recognize many of these same concerns. Here too, we find known elements assembled in a new and striking manner. And the aim is to transform an age old human drama about the flood into a drama about textual transmission. And here too, as we see, for instance, in the Anarchic Book of the Watchers, the result is to elevate the scribe and to claim a wealth of knowledge from before the flood as cultivated by a non-Greek people, in this case, the Jews. And here too, a crisis of transmission with the spread of new Hellenistic empires across the Near East is answered with the assertion that books and knowledge survived even the radical historical rupture of the flood. A claim that actually in this case within the Book of the Watchers is paired with a further claim that Jewish books of knowledge can even bridge the divide between heaven and earth. This is part of what we miss when we read Second Temple texts like the Book of the Watchers primarily in relation to the Bible. To Whitmarsh's insights about the archival sensibility of Greek literature of the early Hellenistic age, for instance, Halbold adds a corollary and attempts to open up existing archives of non-Greek literature and culture. And what we learn from the Dead Sea Scrolls suggests that Jews too may have been engaged in such attempts, not just in Greek, but also in Aramaic. The Aramaic Enoch literature, for instance, doesn't just fill a gap in Genesis. In retrospect, we may read it as an account of the biblical past or as even as a retelling, but in, our, in its own time, as Matthew Goff has also shown, it forms part of a, a, a broader turn to the deep past across the Hellenistic Near East and Mesopotamia in particular. It's certainly intriguing that we find a rise in explicit concern for books and reading in the Jewish literature of the third and second century BCE, precisely the time that we also see the rising prestige of books and libraries across the Hellenistic world. Perhaps like Aristeus, the Enochic and other Aramaic Jewish literature of the time might answer a non-Greek anxiety about what was being omitted from the archivalization of totalizing Greek claims to knowledge. When we triangulate this Hellenistic era Jewish literature also with what we know about the Hellenistic Near East, for instance, from Mesopotamia, we might glimpse the creative power of archival desire, but no less the creative power of archival amnesia. It's long been conventional, for instance, even among scholars of biblical studies to associate cuneiform tablets and Akkadian literature with the ancient Near Eastern background of the Bible, as if somehow this was distinct from the Hellenistic world that shaped Second Temple Judaism. Such tablets, however, did continue to be produced under the Seleucids, and in some cases were even re revised and extended, as Ellen Lindsay, for instance, has shown for the Uruk list of kings and sages. The question, however, raised by, by Halbold in relation to the archive is thus raised of who this literature is, was even for. He draws further on discussions of the archive to illumine the questions in part by stressing that few understood Akkadian at the time, such as the production of these cuneiform texts was not only kept in an archive, but in some sense destined for them. Such tablets were in his words, kept on file in the archives of great temples where they could be consulted by experts but remained out of reach for most, thus almost as inaccessible to Mesopotamian readers as to Greeks. From this paradox seemingly of a literature without readers, he just thus suggests we are drawn to notice the importance of their prestige as an example of the phenomenon of an imperial archive as a repository of total knowledge, which can exert a pull quite apart from any practicalities of storing or retrieving information as repositories of human history, literature, and culture. These were real archives, in other words, but much like Roger Bagnell observes for the Library of Alexandria, their impulse 
was an impact was foremost in how they were imagined. Following Antoinette Burton, Halbold thus looks to the archive as contact zone. His insights, however, might also inspire us to return to Mumembe's sense of despoilment. For Mumembe, the archive document par excellence is generally a document whose author is dead. But what we see in the Aramaic Dead Sea Scrolls is that the dead do not always stay silent, nor are they satisfied to remain sepulchred within the walls of an archive. Sometimes it's in fact their very distance from the past that enables them to be voiced ever anew, particularly by those who claim to be the true custodians of total archives. This context, for instance, might help us to make some sense out of the choice of some Jewish scribes in the early Hellenistic age to write in the name of the antediluvian sage Enoch, a choice that's typically lumped together with other cases of so-called Old Testament pseudepigraphy and read in relation to authorship. In its own context, Enochic discourse might appear to be more akin to the Hellenistic activities of Barosis and other Babylonian scribes who assemble known elements in a new and striking manner. So too, with their claim to speak from before the flood. Its plausibility is grounded within a world of archives that are both claimed to be repositories of total knowledge and profoundly inaccessible to all but the scribe who curates and cultivates its content for others. All the more so, moreover, since the Aramaic Enoch literature claims a connection to the ultimate archive, that is what it calls the heavenly tablets. Already in the Enochic astronomical book, the angel Uriel reads from these tablets to Enoch so as to teach him about celestial cycles. As later in Jubilees, moreover, the unique Jewish access to these heavenly tablets, which is their claim for Moses as well, is tied to a line of scribal transmission already in the Aramaic Dead Sea Scrolls. In the astronomical book and Book of the Watchers, Enoch's scribal status is linked to his access to heaven, but also to his transmission of knowledge from heaven and these heavenly books back to, to earth with his, through his son Methuselah. And this chain continues in works like the admonitions of Kahat, for instance, where books are counted among the inheritance that Kahat passed to his son Amram, father of Moses. The result is a history of Jewish writing that stretches back in an unbroken line of Jewish scribes back from Moses to before the flood with points of contact with the heavenly tablets in between. Among the results is to cast what we might call the biblical past into a history of books and readers. But if part of the catalyst is the Hellenistic era prestige of bookishness most famous from the Library of Alexandria, part of what makes it even possible may be the amnesia inducing effects of the archive in a sense that is perhaps closer to what we glimpse in Berosis or the Uruk list of kings and sages. The forgetting and thus the creativity that becomes enabled by the claim that all knowledge has always been known but is in practice accessible to all but its scribal custodians. We as scholars, of course, also cast ourselves as custodians, and we root our knowledge in libraries and archives of textual and other evidence. And hence part of the value of attention to archival amnesia, in my view, is also to attend to what we forget and what we relevant to forgetting to the stories we tell about ourselves. For scholars of Second Temple Judaism, like me, these have tended to become stories of discovery, recovery, reconstruction, and progress. We trace ourselves back to those who discovered or disseminated once lost materials, to men like Solomon Schechter and R.H. Charles and J.T. Millick. But we rarely trace ourselves back to men like Zeitlin, whom our conventionalized histories of research tend rather to sideline and relegate to forgetting. Like other forgettings, however, this may say as much about us as it does about him. To remember Zeitlin, for instance, is to grapple with what we ourselves also allied when we celebrate what the Dead Sea Scrolls allow us to recover. His example reminds us that in practice, not all new data can be fit within the frameworks of what we already think we knew. And that this find in particular in the moments that it was first exposed was shocking and strange. 
Manuscripts can be published and analyzed, texts can be assembled from their fragments, but it's a much more slow and much more difficult process and sometimes quite uncomfortable to allow new knowledge to upend our received narratives about the past, not least because of the reminder that there's the seeming completeness of what we know about the past is always only an illusion of totality and continuity. It can be tempting to treat familiar narratives about the past as if complete, and hence it's actually not surprising perhaps that even those scholars who are fascinated with lost books and lost voices and half-remembered sects often treat them as if curious footnotes to the story of the past that we already know, or alternately cordon them off into separate secret histories, imagined to be flowing beneath in subterranean streams what remains quite the same as the mainstream. The real challenge and opportunity of new data like the Dead Sea Scrolls, I would suggest, is rather to reassess all of our sources and to try to make space for different kinds of stories to be told. The Dead Sea Scrolls are exemplary of a misfit of newly discovered evidence with older received frameworks about the remembrance of the ancient Jewish past within the Jewish tradition emblematized by Zeitlin. Scholars like Ever Merchek have taken this misfit as an invitation to experiment with new approaches. My suggestion here is that the misfit itself also proves instructive. Not only does it draw our attention to the selectivity of our own frameworks, but it makes visible the multiple sorts of forgetting and the reception of Second Temple Judaism, including in modern scholarship. Such forgetting is not limited to the loss of one text or another, this or that version of a text, but may well challenge the very narratives that we have told about Jewish history and its supposedly clear-cut stages, including with respect to the Bible. To take forgetting seriously then is not just to acknowledge the possibility of lost books or silenced voices, and it's not just to work towards their recovery. It's also to take seriously that history and memory are cultural processes that always yield partial views and partial narratives. All scholarly stories are not just constructed from what has been curated and cultivated as canon, tradition, or heritage. They also hew to the fractures and fault lines of what's been omitted, overwritten, relegated to forgetting in the process. Like mosaicists, we can sometimes only craft our images of the past from stray fragments or eluded spolia, trying to capture something of another age in the process. To be sure we can and we should try to recover as many neglected sources and perspectives as we can, but we should perhaps try to resist a temptation to celebrate our more inclusive stories as if they are complete. All archives silence, all anthologies omit, and the orderliness of all stories, including the one that I've been telling you here today, is predicated on omission. We select as we speak, but we also silence, although perhaps we might hope thus making new spaces to create. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annette. That was an immensely rich and interesting lecture. Um, uh, I am delighted that uh, Blossom Stefanu has um, agreed to offer a response to uh, your lecture. So please, Blossom, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so as always, it's a pleasure to hear Professor Reed's work, and it's truly a pleasure today to give a response to this lecture and a real treat to sort of have had extra time to think along with Professor Reed and follow her expansive questioning of some fundamental models of history writing. So I know you all probably have many questions yourself. I'll keep my remarks brief and just touch on three sort of bundles of ideas which spoke most to me. First of all, I'm curious about being wrong. Solomon Zeitlin was ready to dismiss the Dead Sea Scrolls as forgeries because they diverged from his periodization of Jewish literature. Having already decided when and where Jews write commentaries, evidence that contradicted that was rejected rather than rejecting or at least modifying the theory thus disconfirmed. If this happens consistently in historiography, and it certainly does, then we have to question whether the theory is actually intended to explain the evidence or whether maybe theories serve some other purpose, and if so, what? What is the purpose of the models we build of ancient reading practices 
What do we want from them and what do they give us? If they, those models are more important than and consistently take precedence over the evidence we insist uh, is our first priority, then there are a lot of questions to be asked about how committed we are to obviously wrong and impossible theories of most things, including religious history. My second question is about the potential of examining incompleteness, deselection, discarding, and erasing. So the line of thought opened up just now uh, asks us to account for the profundity of loss, which remains intractably gone, no matter how scrupulously we might adjust our theories and methods. Infinitely more things are lost than have remained. The invitation to attend to forgetting, which we have just received tonight, means slowing down and opening up that moment where otherwise we sort of nod politely when it is acknowledged that a small proportion of texts from the ancient world have survived. Slowing that moment down means thinking about incalculable loss, even in the face of a surviving archive, which is still overwhelming and still far too much to grasp. Paying attention to loss means being smaller than we thought. Here I want to draw out the taxonomy of forgetting which Professor Reed has offered, going beyond accidents to look at textual practices, which because selective, always also entail volunteering to lose certain sections of and paths through the textual world. That includes liturgy, pedagogy, revision, anthologizing, antiquarianism, collecting, and indeed producing chronological narratives, all of these practices produce cleaner fictions out of loss. Canons and other historical textual technologies select and therefore also discard concealing what is gone behind the incredible mass of what is preserved too much to ever know. Selection, even in the process of writing this response, meant me discarding my fascination with the priest Barossus in Babylon and the librarian Kalimachus in Alexandria. Their appearance in this lecture made me, on a day uh, when I was sitting in a beach hotel where Roald Dahl used to go on holiday as a child, think about whether I might like to write a history of librarians in the ancient world, or maybe not an academic history, maybe a Borges or Gaiman-like short story, about Barossus of Babylon and what happens if he fails. So there's an entire alternate timeline on which I follow up this idea, maybe even writing a whole book or article about it. I could of course also have deposited the idea somewhere else rather than deleting it. And in fact, I have a designated place for just such ideas labeled on my computer, the pit of ideas into which I could have just tossed this one. Now in that case, the relationship between that idea and this text or the lecture we just heard would become invisible. The lines of inspiration, not least because we write and speak in a linear fashion where only one thing can come out of our mouths or pens at a time, are rarely traced accurately. It wouldn't have been traced in this case as going Barossa's, Howbold, Annette, Blossom, Babylon, Roald Dahl, Gaiman, Borges, this lecture. Even if we included all these worlds and people shaping the forgotten text, that account would still be wrong because all of those lines of intertextuality and history didn't happen one by one in sequence. They flashed out across continents and epochs crossing worlds in an instant and then faded, which means we need to think about how much is forgotten before we even notice it, let alone how much is forgotten when we make these material and concrete and more or less deliberate decisions about books and archives. It also means it's time to talk about non-linearity 
and the more capacious notions of historiography, which Professor Reed has called for. So the final bundle of ideas in this rich lecture, which I would want to touch on again, has to do with the notion of capacious historiography, historiography which is bigger and has more room to hold more things inside it, a greater capacity, so to speak. Professor Reed asks about history writing, which is not a project of guarding against loss, but rather a practice which can sustain an awareness of loss, not only surveying what remains and knitting together a coherent linear narrative, but expanding scholarly attention around everything else that might also have been remembered or forgotten. Now this of course also clashes with any notion of providence acting in history, as well as with idealist notions of history as a matter of organic development in one inevitable direction. For those religious and scholarly communities attached to the Bible, capacious historiography, which attends to forgetting means, as Professor Reed phrases it, thinking about the biblical past, as a history of books and readers. Now this of course is a very attractive idea to me and I think to many of us here tonight. And there's a lot to think about as to how this challenges an idea of the biblical past as a record of God's intervention in the world. Where is salvation if the people we read about in the Bible are readers and writers talking among themselves? Here we see what Professor Reed has dubbed the creative power of archival amnesia, a fraction of the numerous possible new spaces that are opened up by attention to forgetting. I cannot subscribe any more enthusiastically to the idea that when lost voices, forgotten books, <clears throat> or the half remembered arrive in our attention, we have to do more than clear out a drawer for them and go on about our business. The arrival of such a guest on our historiographical doorstep means it's time to take another look at what we thought was our house and to realize that we have been playing pretend and it is only a blanket thrown over the clothesline. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Blossom. Uh, Annette, would you like to respond to Blossom's uh, response? Yes. And, and, and Yeah, I can, I'll respond briefly and then we can kind of open up a bigger conversation. Is that, yes. is that so thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so thank you for your response, which actually touches on, I mean, a number of things that kind of, I was thinking about is like kind of at stake. So I was, um, to the first notion, I the kind of questioned the purpose of the models like, so why is Zeitlin cares, you know? I mean, it's really amazing. He doesn't write one thing. He like keeps writing over and over and over again. And every time somebody publishes uh, something in the Jewish Quarterly Review on the Dead Sea Scrolls, he like has to add something. <laughs> you know? I was like, really? You know, there is something at stake that is not just accuracy or so forth. Um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that, you know, I, mean, I think we can think with it in different ways, but I think one of the things that we can at least think about a little bit is also the way in which part of what's at stake is that kind of actually akin to Barosis as how Bold describes him, meaning it's akin to this question of like, who gets to be this curator? Who is the keeper of the total, total archive? And I think this is partially, you know, what's interesting to me and what's kind of pressing for me is that a lot of modern scholarship on the ancient Jewish and Christian past really depicts itself as recovery. Mm -hmm. Things that were lost in the Middle Ages, like, yeah, yes, <laughs> you know, modernity has saved them. And thus moderns are like super close to antiquity. And the Middle Ages is just this time where everybody messed things up and lost things or whatever. So we're, put our, we're on the side of recovery. When we put ourselves on the side of recovery, part of that habit is from the way in which, which um, the study of antiquity was defended um, in the 19th and early 20th centuries as being significant. Um, I mean, with this weird kind of double lens in a fact of the sense significant, not just in for, for uh, uh, religious purposes, whether rabbinic, patristic or so forth, 
but at the same time with essentially a crypto theological framework that sounds just like Protestantism. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there really is this kind of um, notion and part of what I kind of try to figure out in, in this book project is the degree to which there's this kind of irony of modern scholars wanting to feel that way, like recoverers of a lost past heroic it's like you know it's like you know you have these discovery narratives like everyone loves this like and you know you to talk to a public audience and like in a second everyone loves it it's like we've discovered this lost past that like oh those those medieval people didn't know we're like have like you know we're right there this like secret book of jesus it's got to be true because it's secret you know <laughs> i mean it's, it's a narrative that you can feel in a room that like attracts people but i also think that the thing is like I think it's interesting to think about, I mean, precisely back to this kind of, of you know, capacious historiography is that the result of that is actually a very narrow historiography. So the case is it actually, it narrows where it says that the heroic, the very heroicness is like, mm -hmm. you know, um, the heroic discovery is actually a narrowed history that wants there to be a total history where there's not. Um, so I think the nonlinearity is also this case is that, you know, I, oh, all difference can be chained into like historical development just like, boop, 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 as opposed to being like, oh no, we have this whole complex world. Um, so this question of like totality, control, singularity, but I think the question of authority is like very foremost. And I'll say just one quick thing that it's just like, it's not, I think I find it so fascinating that of the, of the voices that are speaking now to this, um, I, almost all of them are women. Um, and I think there's a way in which like, I know, I know I'm like a Japanese American <laughs> scholar or whatever. I know that I'm not gonna be remembered in the world at all. Of course not. I'm not the stuff of history. I walk as like a ghost in the world. If I say anything, it's only gonna be remembered if some man repeats it in a book that then gets like attributed to him. Like I move through the world knowing that I'm ephemeral. Um, so I'm going to, you know, unlike Zeitlin, I was <laughs> like, no, no, my, my views will remain true forever, which is very poignant. And it's also cases, both of us are situated. We're like, no less, it's not one of us is right or wrong. But in terms of models of scholarship, I think there's a kind of pointedness. Like, um, I think about, you know, the, um, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a pointed awareness of the possibility that what one says is just just going to like you know it's like smoke you know uh, which makes it you know fun I, I think that it makes many of us I, I, I'd be curious to know if I think that whether you know this is you, that makes sense at all but I think that there is this kind of sense in which an unstable narrative from seen from that point of view is a place of creativity or the possibility that hey maybe something else might be kept not just like these like you know um, certain kinds of totalizing narratives. Like you, you, once you break them, you like make space for other voices versus having that fear that once you break them, you'll do it, that, that your own authority will be lost. So I think there's a kind of interesting tension there. So hopefully that, I didn't say that too quickly that it did make sense, but just to raise a couple things. And I also wanted to, to note also the, um, like one of the kind of seeds for this, for this chapter that also became the talk is also you had sent me the Mememde article on like Facebook Messenger. So we have all, our like little network also kind of expands <laughs> of the invisible network behind the, the, the thought. So thank you. Do you want to respond, Blossom, before we move on? No, uh, absolutely. I just agree a zillion percent that realizing that you're not going to be heard and that no one's listening can give you a huge amount of freedom because nobody's listening. You can do whatever you want, um, which is a sort of grim freedom that, that uh, I think many of many women and many otherwise marginalized, racialized or feminized people are grasping onto now and just running with. So I think it's a very, exciting time to be a scholar. So I think we should turn to some questions. Uh, so please everyone, if you have uh, questions or comments, uh, please uh, put them in the Q&A uh, button and uh, we'll turn to them. Um, I, I could maybe start with uh, posing a question too. Um, I, I, some, I, I tend to find, uh, find fascinating um, 
<laughs> the things that are there in plain sight, but the, the things that we don't see necessarily, even though they're there. Uh, and, and I'm wondering um, what what do you? It's a terrible question, but what do you think we are actually not seeing, and what is it that we have forgotten now that is actually there if we have just changed our models uh, in a way that would make us see it? You see what I mean? <laughs> uh, we, I'm sure we're forgetting something. I'm sure we are not. Un there, there are things that we do not see. Uh, how, what would you say? Uh, what is it that is there for us around the next corner to see? Actually, it's almost impossible to answer that question. It is. <laughs> um, it is an interesting, I mean, that's partially what I like about the idea of the archival is partially the despoiling is like such a rich metaphor, but it's also like a way of noting that, you know, we're not, that it's not just things that are omitted, even inside of what we're keeping, we're keep, can sometimes keep it in a way that doesn't let us see it. Um, so I think, you know, most of our things we don't see are about who's, you know, like that's what we, we tend to, we tend to weirdly enough, like erase our agents. And I think because your work also shows, um, and as we've, you know, this kind of notion, if you really want to tell a material history, um, there is so much we don't know. Um, and, you know, those kind of cases um if we really want to say okay we can't presume that we know we have to take seriously what we don't know in um in a way that um by beginning with our manuscript evidence um you know even what we think we know about the bible like she just comes to be you know very um um i think that's something that people don't want to see mm -hmm. um you know, I mean, obviously we have we have fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they do not cover anything close to what we're accustomed to getting from like Aleppo or Leningrad. So the case is like, oh, how much are we actually, you know, even when we say like, oh, this is the part we know, mm -hmm. but even so I think that's something that, you know, if we really took seriously. OK, every scholar of biblical studies has also have to know something about like medieval manuscripts, because that's the primary man textual basis they're working on most of the time. Like that's something that's just would be quite, people liked that elephant in the room to be invisible because it's actually pretty big. Mm -hmm. um, so if I, you know, so I think that that's the, the, the materiality stuff is actually very serious in that way. Um, and then also this kind of um, the notion of how, um, you know, what we think of as counting as preservation and the degree to which we're really like, there are only a couple of models that we're really using, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's like, Thanks. there's a lot, yeah, there's a, um, for, I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of things that, that the more you think about, the more uncomfortable you get, but I mean, it's like, there, there definitely are quite a few of them. And it's probably good that we only deal with like a couple at a time. So good idea. Yeah. <laughs> so Esther, are there any questions in the Q and A? There are. Um... I have a lovely question from Marion Grau who asks, what is at stake in highlighting the gappy character archives of memory, which complete or not, continue to be wielded as an instrument of colonial control over those people whose memories are transmitted orally and therefore are seen as devoid of culture or memory? Is there a way to decolonize the prevalence of writing over oral tradition with the help of your research? Yeah, this is a tricky one. Um, and it's actually pertaining to like what I what I just said as well is because the sense is we can say on the one hand, oh, we have to take seriously our material evidence for writing when we decide what's ancient or not. Um, but on the other hand, when we even say that, we're assuming that writing is the only thing that counts. Um, we haven't done much to deal well with oral transmission. Um, there's definitely a lot more to do, but I think definitely part of what's at stake. I mean, this is a you know, it's is is I mean, akin to the problem of like Hegel's people without history, and the reception of that is to kind of note that if we the those materials that are preserved primarily orally or by peoples who haven't had the stability to have like continuous textual traditions, even when they had textual traditions. Um, when we, you know, so um, I think that's really, I mean, I, I, I think it's a big, it's a big issue and it's an issue I hope like we're able to talk about, but it's really kind of an open issue. But one of the things we have to, we have to keep in mind. Mm 
Um, so put it differently. I mean, you know, if I give the example of uh, like the trans, you know, transmission of the Hebrew Bible, for instance, as contrasted with the transmission of the Septuagint or the New, New Testament, part of the reason for that gap has to do with, you know, dispersion of Jewish populations. So, you know, we can both say, make that, make certain claims, and then we have to kind of also think about how, um, you know, if we, we decide only to, to, to depend on texts, like we're really narrowing our view of like who even counts as having had a history. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, um, um, or, you know, who chose to, to embrace print when? I mean, these types of questions, you know, so I think it's, it's really, you know, it's very important questions, but also very like, they're very puzzling, especially because there have been also in our same fields, the tendency to be really lazy about oral tradition. Just like things we want to be old. <laughs> um, so we, it's like, that's an area that I think once we kind of, you know, talk, once we're able to take texts and te the materiality of texts more seriously in the way that like Liv and others have been doing, I think one of that'll be kind of allow us to also talk about um, other modes of transmission and how to talk about them mm -hmm. in a way that, 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 that is actually as rigorous, mm -hmm. but with that precisely at stake. So thank you, that's a great question. Are there any more questions? Uh, yeah, uh, Robert Van Hoff asks, were the scribes of the Aramaic Enochic texts strategizing to be relevant and remembered? And why Aramaic tellings of narratives we know were in Hebrew? Uh, so, um, I, you know, we can only guess about what they are strategizing. <laughs> um, so I, we can kind of talk about their context and what they see, what their, their work, what cultural work their writing seemed to be doing, um, which I discussed a bit here. And also I write about a bit in my last book, which is about demons, um, this kind of interest in, in textualization, expertise, and the kind of projection of their being, um, the imagination of a Jewish textual heritage that doesn't begin with Moses as writer, but actually stretches far back so that it rivals that of Egyptians, Babylonians, and other kind of non-Greek people that have been celebrated by Greeks. Um, I think the question of like telling the same um, narratives that we know were in Hebrew, which I'll also note. I don't think they were telling the same narratives that we know in Hebrew. Um, you know, with what the narratives are telling, you know, something people have a tendency to focus, scholars have had a tendency to focus on those parts of the Aramaic Enoch literature that most parallel Genesis. Um, that's really not all of it. There's like a whole bunch of other stuff. So it's like, you know, this is like, like lunar visibility, about like astronomy. Um, so that's just more of a habit of, a, of the scholarly focus on the familiar. Um, but even when people talk, for instance, about the Book of the Watchers, which is the most discussed one, everybody focuses on pretty much 10 chapters, um, 36 chapters. And the second half is just, you know, about all kinds of stuff. So, you know, that's the stuff people don't focus on. So part of it is, you know, that there's this notion of what, what, the scholars presume that what is important about it must be the thing that's closest to like the Bible. But as a result, you know, the number of works written on one Enoch six to 11 is like most of the scholarship on Enoch literature, you know, 17 to 36. It's like, you know, there's oh, it's like one book. <laughs> you know? So anyway, I think it's kind of an interesting, some of that's an artifact of just like the way that scholars have tended to, like once you narrow it to saying, oh, this must be in relation to Genesis, you're actually also not seeing a lot of the actual material, let alone the astronomical book, which is about completely other stuff, so, but thank you. There are also a couple of questions in the chat, Esther, do you see them? Um, I do. Uh, there's a question from Robin Walsh who asks, I am incredibly moved by your framing of which scholarship is remembered. Do you ever struggle with having to engage continually with the historical gatekeepers of our extant, quote, evidence? How do we become more inclusive while also having to professionally live in the toxic spaces that they created? I'm thinking here about having to contend with the work of romantic thinkers, et cetera. Yeah, that's also a big question. Um, this is, it's a very, it is tricky, you know. Um, I mean, 
I think there's a kind of, uh, um, I partially like, I like to learn a lot about the 19th century. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> because the case is like, I think some of these, these notions is that um, you get to hear some of the, the paths not taken. Um, so it kind of destabilizes what we often tell is these like um, narratives of progress towards us. Um, so instead of telling like the same story that hits the same fronts in every history of scholarship in the front of every article in the beginning of every dissertation hits like, you know, where you basically have like five men, you know, five is even like a lot, you know, but the same guys like every single time. I would say it's just like even thinking about people who disagreed with them or had other views at the time, just kind of historic. So I, for me, for some of those figures, I have this idea that the importance is to historicize them, which also... Um, it's also that act of like the, the kind of um, re-particularizing them. Um, so it's like, well, let's say we talk about, I don't know, like F.C. Bauer or somebody or Harnack. I mean, they're not even the only people at the time they live. And often you can see how that putting them in their bigger worlds also, you know, kind of uh, is able to think of them in a different way. So that's partially one of the ways I do this. Um, in the forgetting book in, in particular, one of the things I'm experimenting with, and this kind of is interesting um, in the terms that Blossom noted is actually that non-linearity of like each, what, each kind of chapter kind of hops in time. So really trying to resist the temptation to just tell like, well, you know, to say, oh, this person made this one story. I'm either gonna turn it upside down into like a revised version of that story where it's actually the same story. It's just the good people are bad and the bad people are good. Um, or tell my own like story, and you know, so just to say like, oh, part of the problem is actually, you know, that thinking our evidence is beads on a chain. So I think there's, those are the kind of two approaches, but it's very tricky. So, and, you know, I think it's like more, a lot of experimentation, I think will be, you know, hopefully for a lot of people. So we do have another question in the Q&A uh, from Carlos Solzbach. Uh, just curious how Zeitlin would have been less concerned about the upsetting of the historical paradigm of late antiquity slash early middle ages by consigning the Qumran text to the circles of the Karaites. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, he, he, he like, I mean, I think partially for Zeitlin I mean, his, he has these like volumes on like the second Commonwealth, you know, like he is the second temple period and is, is very important to him, both as the, his primary knowledge. So I think he's happy to kind of push the confusion, <laughs> anything confusing forward <laughs> um, versus really wanting to, to say that there's like that period of time, there's like a very set story. Um, I think there's also probably a hint in the way he also calls it the second Commonwealth like he's interested in that as a political history. Um, and that has some sort of reason why it's important to him. Like as a period of that included Jewish sovereignty. Um, so I, mean, I think that's, that, 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 that's my guess. Um, I do think he's a, fa he's a really fascinating figure, but it's, it's part of what's tricky is he makes this argument over and over and over. So he's just his, like, you know, I'm even sorting through what he wrote about it. I mean, talking, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm still, I could, I'm like, have a good start on it, but he just, he just like, you're just reading these repetitive like iterations of things because he wrote about it so often. Um, so it's a little hard, like maybe I'll figure out something more later, but that's kind of my guess right now. Liv, is it okay if I ask a question of my own? Of course, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> So I loved your talk so much, Annette. Thank you so much. And um, one of the things that I've been thinking about recently is a lot is the question of representation of people in the present who look at the past and want to see themselves there. And looking at, for instance, your chart of which books were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, I noticed Ruth was almost at the bottom. Esther is, of course, not represented at all. And the books that were found that were extra biblical books are not books that are particularly affirming of gender or sexual minorities. And so it struck me that even if you want to say, okay, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls transformed what we knew about the era, it do still doesn't necessarily transform them in a way that's liberative to a lot of people. 
So how do we, instead of just saying, well, now we have new evidence so we can find an even more concrete view of the past and now we've found it, um, instead use that to kind of poke holes and look at the past as more spongy, more capacious as something that contains more than what we have evidence of. Um, it, seem, it just seems like your work might point in that direction. Yeah, oh, thanks so much. Um, yeah, I think that part of the, um, yeah, that's, I mean, part of what I'm resisting is actually that notion of saying, well, okay, now we have the C schools, we have a new complete version. So basically just becoming Zeitlin again, it's just like, you know, <laughs> um, even if we don't agree with what he says, or, you know, Zeitlin himself is just replicating, he replicates a lot of what like Henrik Gretz said. Um, so it's like, just everybody just feel, okay, now we're certain, no, 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 now we're certain, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, with this idea of this real case of the a certain we that thus like it erases a lot of people along the way. Um, I think with this, the, the, I mean, the question of gender is kind of like the big one because it's this way in which it's like the most obvious forgetting. I mean, it's so obvious. And yet it's so striking that people don't think of it as obvious. Uh, it's just, um, you know, uh, like I, I always remember there's this, this case in which like, um, you know, Gibson and Smith, the, the two women who were involved in the, the, um, <laughs> you know, the Cairo Geniza and related for, you know, who um, were the catalysts for Schechter to, to, dis to um, find the Ben Sierra fragments and also found a number of palimpsests or, some, or, you know, in one of their writings, they say this, they have this, this, this like statement like oh you know there's nothing there's nothing in the serious world of ours that doesn't leave a trace mm -hmm. and there's something that's incredibly poignant about it because when you read what they wrote like they knew what they were being forgotten at the time they were writing <laughs> like they knew it you know and even as they wrote it they wrote okay this is how these things were found um with regard to some of the palimpsests and then people in the public in the press were just publishing things that were totally just not that account where that made them seem like they weren't even like really involved um, or that they were just kind of accidental, that their kind of knowledge of Arabic, for instance, didn't have like a big part to do with how they were able um, to, um, you know, have their travels, be able to have textual work. But so, I mean, it's an interesting case in which I think the sense is the, um, those erasures are both, are, are, I, mean, I guess that's another one of our elephants in the room or whatever, They're, those erasures are both so self-evident and so much not dealt with. Um, and I think um, the, the notion, I, I would also add that I think part of the, the, what they kind of make clear to us though is that when we're talking about issues of a more inclusive history, it's not, it's not to say, oh, let's like find specific things and include them. It's like, actually, we just have to do history in a different way that is more inclusive. Um, and I think that's actually part of the challenge is not just say like, I'm gonna take this and like edit it. I'm gonna take this and edit it. It's like, no, actually, we just need to basically like make us may, be able to speak in a, in a way that um, takes meaning from and also takes seriously like just the vast expanses of silence in the historical record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So unfortunately, we are nearing the end of our time together now. So, um, well, there is time to say thank you. Thank you so much, Annette, for a fantastic lecture. And thank you, Blossom, for the response. And thank you all for your questions and comments. And thank you also, Esther, for all your help with, with the, the reading of the questions and also for your question. So thank you again, Annette. This was a blast. Oh, no, thanks, thank thanks, you to, yeah, thanks to you both and thanks to, to, to Blossom as well. So I really appreciated it. Thank you.